Welcome to the future of cruising sustainable ship series. This is our second segment. And if this is the first time that you're joining us, if you're new to our program, we are exploring the cruise industry in depth, how they're coming back after COVID-19, how we're going to be looking at the industry new and different, that we're not just wanting to come back being uh, the same as we were before. We want to come back being better. And being better means being sustainable because we've seen the difference that sustainability has made on our planet while we've had a pause during our time in our homes. And this is a time for us to say, what do we want? And how do we want our industry? How do we want to travel? How do we want people to explore in the future? So on this particular segment, we're focusing on sustainable places, ecologically rich protected areas and how they will be compatible with tourism compatible with ships, certainly, and really just compatible in general in a post-COVID world. So today we're exploring the Vanilla Islands. And if you're not familiar with the islands, you're not alone. And our first guest is going to teach us all about the Vanilla Islands and tell us where they are. And also it tell us about the program that he's been working on to create a sustainable tourism study which is actually the world's largest cruise tourism study that's ever been done. So his name is Grant Holmes. He's a global VP cruise solutions for Inchscape Shipping Services. And they are the largest uh, and global cruise solution team in the world that is handling 10,000 cruise ship calls all around the world. Very, very experienced gentleman and a very, I would say, engaging gentleman. I think that you will like what he has to say. So I'd like to invite Grant onto the screen right now. And as we do that, we have two guests today. We have Grant Holmes and Naveen Sani. So Grant, welcome onto the screen. Welcome onto the Hello. program. <laughs> nice to see you. Yes, I wanted to mention that as well. Grant comes to us today from Dubai. So that's a, a, a good fair piece. And it's late in the evening for him. So thank you so much for spending time with us on your on your right. evening. I really, really appreciate that. So um, tell us about this Vanilla Island Sustainable Cruise Ship Study. And you know why you, why Inkscape, and why is the industry looking at this area of the world right now? Sure. Well, uh, Inchcape is the world's largest maritime service provider, and we entered a tender, which was funded by the European Union and four other local entities in the Vanilla Islands, and we won that tender. Uh, the study uh, encompasses uh, the development of a sustainable cruise tourism strategy for the whole region. Now, the Vanilla Islands is located in the Indian Ocean. It includes uh, six territories or countries and 12 ports. The uh, encompasses, uh, now um, the, the map you can see there is the Inchcape Global Network. In fact, before COVID-19, we were set to do 10,000 cruise calls. And you can see on the map the exact location of the Vanilla Islands. You can see the large island there being Madagascar and then the very north part of it will be the Seychelles. And further south, you can see in the southeast, you can see uh, Mauritius and Reunion Island. Reunion is a French territory. And there is also Comoros and Mayotte. All these locations are the Vanilla Islands. And we have to protect the integrity of these destinations in a sustainable way if we're to grow cruise tourism, because these Destinations are completely new to cruise tourism. The largest number of calls any destination has is Mauritius, and that's only 40 calls per year, which is uh, preciously few. And some of them have never had a, a single call. So we need to be very oh, careful. Grant, I'm sorry. So, so in essence, um, this is a pristine area that is like what the Caribbean was probably like many years ago and yes. long before this type of tourism so we're starting with we're starting from scratch here and we're starting with an area that has not been spoiled in many respects we have a blank canvas uh, these locations are idyllically beautiful but they're not used to large numbers of tourists and uh, they do not have great infrastructure or development so th there is a lot um, to organize 
so moving forward uh, on the slide, we can show you uh, each destination and articulate a little bit more about each destination. So here you can see Mauritius, which is possibly the most developed of all the regions. Um, in terms of flight capacity, airlift. So this is where we're intending to do the main home porting. Uh, but what we intend to do, even in Mauritius and every destination, is restrict the number of calls. We think that the regulations of MARPOL and CLEAR and IMO are already good, but it, it, it's about the number of ships that come and the impact of, the, of this can be from either a ship perspective or a people perspective. So we need to manage it very carefully um, within the study. And so far we've completed phase one and one phase two. We're looking at restricting the number of people and the number of ships in each destination. But the main gateway for the Vanilla Islands will be Mauritius. And that was the sighting where the last dodo bird was seen. And we're pitching, if you can move to the next uh, slide, we can see Grant, that, before you before you go on, um, I was curious to know how are the the people of the area going to like restriction? And I think that's a big reason why a lot of ports have been um, very overrun, is because the local people would also like to make money, and they would also like to have a lot of tourism. So, how do you balance locally their interest in their own land and also their interest in in making a living? Well, there, fortunately, there's a very strong culture of sustainability in the Vanilla Islands. You know, the Seychelles in particular has won awards for its uh, sustainability and its approach to sustainability. And all hotels have to build into their business ethos uh, sustainable practices to, to manage. So they do understand. And at the moment, they sincerely don't have the capacity to handle high volumes. So they understand you know and and we need to get the investment in in line with the capacity in line with the future sustainability all, all at the same time and we've made a 10-year plan actually and it's very rarely the cruise destination will plan from a1 you know 10 years ahead now here you can see you know we're pitching the the Mauritius is the main destination for adventure. You know, it's got the third largest uh, zip line in the world. It's got a beautiful mountain range. There are jeep safaris and all manner of uh, adventure type tours and hiking that, that, that can be done in, in Mauritius, which makes it a very attractive, but it has to be executed in a sustainable way. So every single tour or or tour operator, we want to be certified by the GSTC, which is the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. And we're looking to get certifications for the tours. This is one of the recommendations that will be coming out of the, the study. So moving on, we can see the Island of Reunion. This is the second gateway for the Vanilla Islands. This is a French territory. Uh, you can see, uh, normal European Union signs all around and it's really first world in, in Reunion because uh, it's completely French. It's a volcanic island and it's a very active volcano and if you can see on the screen on the left side uh, the volcano erupts usually three times a year and it often destroys the road and the road is always rebuilt by the European Union. It's amazing uh, how they've organized it. And here in Reunion, uh, there are parts uh, at the top of the volcano and around, because you've got two volcanoes actually, one on the left which is active and the one on the right is uh, inactive. There are whole villages where you hike and walk around. It's uh, a lot of vanilla production in, in Reunion and it's the second embarkation port uh, because there are direct flights from France and from other European destinations and it has European protocols in the airport. So Reunion is very much behind the thrust of the cruise tourism study and they've uh, brought the European Union in to uh, to fund it. So there is a vanilla element to the vanilla island. <laughs> there is absolutely a vanilla element. In fact, vanilla is produced in all of the islands and as you know, it's a very expensive uh, commodity and they have uh, vanilla 
fabrication in Reunion, but to be honest, the main fabrication is in Madagascar, which we will come to shortly. So um, moving forward, we can see the Seychelles. Uh, the Seychelles is an archipelago full of islands. Uh, the main island is Mahe, is where the airport is, and Port Victoria, the main town. It only has two berths and, uh, you know, the, the streets are very narrow, uh, some beautiful, stunning hotels. Some of the world's best beaches are in Seychelles. Uh, it's magnificent and Praslim and other islands close by uh, can be visited uh, by cruise ships. And some smaller niche cruise lines like our friends in Ponon uh, do itineraries throughout the whole of the, the Seychelles. But the, the transportation type is something to consider here, how we, how we manage the movement of people in these narrow streets. So our restrictions are no more than uh, 3,000 passengers per day. And we're looking at Seychelles to be the home port and the gateway for luxury cruising in the region. So uh, moving forward. So now we enter Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar is the fourth largest island on the planet. Uh, we've all seen the movie Madagascar 1 and 2, and it's very true because this movie really helped me when I went there uh, because you, all these lemur uh, monkey-type animals are there everywhere. There are all kinds of lemur. Uh, the, the scenery in Madagascar is breathtaking. The climate changes dramatically from one part of the island to the other. And it, whilst it, it is a humble uh, country and quite poor in places, uh, it was more developed than I thought. And I had a pleasant surprise about the, you read things about crime. I did not experience that at all. I, I thought it was a stunningly beautiful place. Some of the world's best scenery and 90% of all the animals uh, in uh, and the wildlife in Madagascar is indigenous to the island itself, which is quite uh, amazing when you go there. And I recommend anyone, if you've not been to Madagascar, it should be at the top of your um, bucket list. So moving forward, we can see these baobab trees. This is the most stunning uh, trees that I've ever seen in my life. And when you see them at a sunset, like you can see in the picture there, it really is breathtaking. And from this baobab, you can get special oils for medical uh, treatments and even to make you look young. I've got it on my hair at the moment, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there are many uses of the baobab and the, the fauna and flora that is available in, in Madagascar is, quite, is second to none. It's really a world that most people in the Western world are not aware of. And it, it, it's just stunning to see scenes like you can see in, in the picture there. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, these are the limours you see in uh, Madagascar. And you can get quite close to them. And some of them are quite cheeky. And some of them are in hotels. <laughs> you can be in a hotel eating and a, and a limour will come and try to steal your dinner. <laughs> uh, but these are unbelievable and they come black or white and all types of colors and they are unique to Madagascar and you can find them in all the port destinations that we visit in Madagascar and uh, it, it, this is part of the unique wildlife but on top of that you know you have uh, the tomato frog and, and the giraffe ant and the ant has a very long neck and it's a giraffe completely unique uh, wildlife that you can actually see and access. You know, there are different uh, national parks uh, all over Nas Madagascar where some of it, you can see the wildlife up front. And they even have the night limor, which is like a little mouse and, and it operates, it's a nocturnal, only comes out at night. So if you go to Madagascar and experience from a cruise, you must see the wildlife, but we must restrict how we interact with the wildlife, you know. What I was just going to ask that question. That means that this is a creation of um, of tours that are smaller, that are more intimate, that allow you to get up front, you know, and close. Um, I, I have had the great good fortune of being on safari in Africa, and it makes a huge yes. difference the size of the group that you're with, how close yes. you can get to the wildlife. 
Well, there are no large buses in Madagascar. All the buses are, are smaller uh, buses and transportation. And they were expecting me to change that, but I, I've actually suggested we keep it as it is. And we actually look to invest in more Jeeps and we look at the types of uh, fuel that is being used, you know. So it, I think I agree with you, smaller groups, and, and that would mean more tourist guides need to be trained, but, but there's a, a quite high unemployment in parts of Madagascar, so it will be a great employment generator, and we can connect people. And remember that everybody in Madagascar speaks French, as well as Malagasy. So uh, with that, European languages can be covered, and there is a growing number of people that can speak English. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, we can see some more. Um, uh, here is a, an island in Madagascar. This is the main tourist destination of the whole of Madagascar. It's called Nozibé. Nozibé means big island. And here you've got these stunning uh, white sandy beaches, but you can also see the limours. The picture you saw there was taken in Nozi Bay, where there's a wildlife park, and you can visit the limours. So you can have Fred, this. I'm sorry, I understand that this is the starting point of the cruise itineraries, isn't it? Nozi no, Bay? Uh, well, no, the Mauritius is the starting point, okay. and then it usually goes to uh, Reunion and then to Madagascar. Uh, starting with the east coast, but Nozibé is on the west coast of Madagascar, mm -hmm. northwest, and it's just off the main island, but it's the number one tourist destination. The The airport looks like a, an enlarged shed, but actually it's the second largest airport in Madagascar because uh, they have international flights. I actually flew there from, um, uh, from Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, and you can also go there from Kenya and from Mayotte, uh, but it's very not easy to get to. Most flights go to Antanarivo, the capital, mm -hmm. and move out. But this is the main and very popular with Italians and French. I found a lot of Italian and French people there, and there are direct flights in the season from Italy uh, and some mm -hmm. from France. But Nozibé is a beautiful tourism island, uh, very luscious and white sandy beaches. And Andalina, this beach you can see here, is the most famous beach. Mm -hmm. And moving forward. I think this is one of your shore excursions that you're excited about. Yes. <laughs> so we have to find sustainable shore excursions. And uh, in Tolia, we, we restrict, uh, it's a city in the uh, southwest of Madagascar. And there are 21,000 rickshaws, uh, but not a lot of buses. <laughs> so we, we looked at this and said, from these rickshaws, we can select the top 200 and we're going to decorate them and we're going to use pedal power because there's nothing more sustainable than using pedal power. And it employs more people and you can get two people in a rickshaw. So this is not one of our developed rickshaws, but we will make very fancy rickshaws and we'll probably do that to about 250, employing local people to do it. And uh, we have restricted one small ship of 1,000 people to Tolia in the, in the south. It's also known as Tulia in, from the west. And these rickshaws uh, will have a planned route and we'll take each of the cruise guests all around the city in a rickshaw, which is a unique way. And in fact, in Tolia, the only way to, to get around in many respects. Uh, and you will see so many uh, beautiful sights and interactions with the people. Uh, the local people I found extremely uh, friendly and they were not used to seeing tourists. And, and this was a very pleasant experience uh, going around uh, Tolia. So, the rickshaws and pedal power is, is one of the unique ways of making things sustainable and getting a lot of people employed at the same time. Grant, and if then, I just mention, yes. you've got about another, say, minute and a half to finish yes. this portion, and you have still, I guess, Mayotte and Comoro, so I want to make sure that you, you touch on those yes. briefly. Well, um, Mayotte is a French territory also, and uh, Mayotte is... Uh, a beautiful island. It's uh, known for its ecology and its microclimate. Uh, it has beautiful beaches. The, the last call was 2006 until this year where I personally handled a call for the Marco Polo. Uh, and instead of going to the port, we went by tender to make it more sustainable and because there's not enough transportation. 
We understand there's only three buses on the island. And so, you know, my yacht, we feel, has got a really good future. But again, we're restricting it to one small ship per day of 1,000 guests to strip the numbers. And moving forward, we can see Comoros. And there's the ecotourism of my yacht. And here's Comoros. The main town is, uh, the main island is Moroni. And we're going to develop Moroni first. There are two other ports um, called Boingama and and um, Mutsumandu, and the, both of these we, we will develop at a later stage. Uh, Comoros has a World Heritage Site. It's, uh, it's very underdeveloped. Uh, there's only been one call in the past, uh, but again, we think we can organize a tendered solution uh, with sustainable tours there and uh, make it really interesting. And in particular, they have the thing called the Grand Wedding. When, when you're 60 years old, and you have a wife, your wife chooses another wife for you. And it's a younger wife, and they call it the grand wedding. And we're trying to do, uh, recreate a grand wedding for a cruise ship call, because we think this will be something very uh, interesting and involve the community uh, very much. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> I have never heard of that before. <laughs> so there are many, we're trying to keep the ethnicity, the local culture and the engagement of local people with, with the cruise ships that come. We want to make it sustainable by restricting the number of ships. So that restricts the emissions, restricts the people tourism impact on these islands. And, and we want to also expand the short season to year round cruising to generate the growth, but not impact on the daily sustainability. And if we make these conditions in advance, we can be sure to protect the integrity of all the vanilla islands dest uh, destinations which are really stunningly beautiful That's you know, great. which is our main our main uh, goal of the project well grant we really really appreciate you being here today uh what we're going to do now is um is is actually bring our next guest on so uh while you are uh, exiting our screen i just wanted to mention that anyone who would like to put a post a question to grant grant will be back and he'll be back for questions and answers after naveen sani comes on so there's a place on your screen that says ask a question that's where you ask a question if you put a question in chat we won't we'll see it but we won't use it in our question and answer so make sure that you look at the q a and then you can also vote on a question so if you like someone else's question it'll bubble it up to the top and those are the top questions that will be fed to us first in the q a session so um so grant once again thank you for that very very informative and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here very shortly yeah we'll So I'd like to invite uh, Naveen Sani onto the program. And Naveen is the CEO of the Americas for Comoros, Cultural Tourism and Expedition. Comoros has been leading the way in the new French cruise uh, sector, and he and Naveen Sani has really been stimulating that growth for a while. And he has done a wonderful job also bringing the cultural tourism into Comoros. And that has lifestyle cruising. So uh, they are the cruise line that is cruising all over the world, but has chosen the Middle Islands as one of their itinerary places. So they're at the forefront of this, and the going to come on and tell us about cruising there, but also in general, their sustainable practices, because you have to be a sustainable ship to be cruising in a sustainable destination. That is required. So let's bring Navin on to the screen. Naveen, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm excellent. And you're, you're coming from New York, so you're a little bit closer than Grant is. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Thank Same. you so much for, jo for joining us today. I, I just wanted to mention that the, the history that you and I have is, is extraordinary. And I can vouch for how long you've been in the industry by how long I've been in the industry because we worked <laughs> together at, at Holland America back in, shall we tell them, the 70s? Indeed. And, and, <laughs> Right behind me, you'll see a ship that Joyce was instrumental in chartering to digital equipment deck, wow. as it was known then. That's the QE2 from my time at Kinard when we joined forces, not just for the QE2, but also Sea Goddess, which today sails the Sea Dream and other ships. That's a 
Amazing. Thank you for that blast from the past. That was an incredible time. Uh, I really thank you for coming on the program. It's uh, it, it's wonderful to see you, and it's uh, it's great to have you with us. You know, the other day when I was chatting with you to to prepare for this, I asked you about the ethos of Ponant and wanting to know about the sort of sustainability ethos. And you had a very interesting response to that. And I wanted to know if you would just share that with everyone when I said, what is the ethos of Ponant in sustainability? Absolutely. And, and you know, we take tremendous pride in it. Ponant was formed in 1988, the same year that Seaborn and Celebrity were founded. Uh, it is unique as a company because it's it was founded by sailors and it is uh, led even today by uh, founder CEO in France. And being led by sailors has a remarkable difference. And the difference is for us, sustainability is not a corporate initiative. It is not something trendy where you get rid of plastic straws and things of that nature. It is a way of life. Sailors have a symbiotic relationship with the ocean there is nothing they'd rather see but to be utmostly respectful of the ocean and to ensure that you give back to the ocean at least what you take from it, if not more. And that truly is the DNA of Pono, from the master all the way down to the able-bodied seaman. Everyone on board is completely wired into sustainability. So you're not you're not aspiring to be sustainable. You are sustainable. It is a way of life for us. It is a way of life. We are sustainable. And all we're trying to do is ensure that people coming on board are respectful of that, that their expectations are met. And our entire fleet is all about destination cruising. Mm -hmm. Our vessels are simply nothing more than the most comfortable and one of the most modern ways in our industry to experience any destination, including the vanilla islands and scattered islands within them and, and Madagascar. Well, you know, you brought a few visuals and I think it'd be good if we speak while we're showing the visuals so people can see uh, that Ponant is both, I think the first picture is uh, wind power and uh, motor power and getting even more environmental even with, with, the, uh, with the motor power, correct? Yes, so just to give you a quick uh, overview, what you see on the right side of your screen is Lupona. It's our flagship. It appears in the logo. She was launched in 1991. It's wind powered and can also use, uh, obviously, uh, uh, turbines and, and the engine. On the left is Le Champlain. It's one of our six Explorer class vessels. Uh, it has uh, obviously uh, got some of the most modern facilities on board. The ship was launched just two years ago in 2018. And uh, um, it is one of the many ships in our fleet that is now classified uh, and certified as green. And I'll speak a little bit about that uh, as we go into it. Let's, let's just roll through another visual, um, which includes our fleet. Uh, in the next year, we will have a fleet of 12 ships under Pono. They begin on the top left of your screen with Lou Pono, which is the ship that the company was founded with. She will come out of the shipyard in Italy in March next year and undergo a major refurbishment. All she'll have then will be 32 berths, 16 staterooms. She will be ultra luxury and will sail in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea area and be available only for private charter. Uh, she will not be a retail market ship. She will be truly extraordinary. Um, and it is a wonderful vessel for those clients that may wish to celebrate something unique with their best friends and family. Uh, to the right of that, uh, on your screen, is the Boreal class of ships. We began launching these in 2010. and. Uh, there are four of these, the Boreal, the Austral, the Solial, and the Lirial. And they range from 132 staterooms at maximum to 122 staterooms. Uh, they are truly uh, 
the beginning of what luxury expeditions has now become a major category in our industry. That began with Pono uniquely combining the small size of these ships with sustainable practices in the expeditionary space. Actually, Naveen, I'm recalling when the Boreal first came out that that was the first time that I had seen sustainable attached to a cruise ship. Indeed, indeed. And I, I'll get into that in a, in a minute or two when I share a little bit about uh, the uh, clean ships. To the bottom left, you'll see six small ships, and those are Explorer class ships. The first of these was launched in June of 2018. Uh, they are a little bit smaller than the Boreal class ships, only 92 straight staterooms, and they have what is absolutely incredible and unique. It's an underwater lounge called the Blue Eye. It is about two meters below the waterline on the ship, and I want to share with you a short story on how this originated. Years ago, our founder, as I mentioned, is a sailor, Jean Emmanuel Sauvé. He was talking to Jacques Cousteau, and they were discussing what might be possible under the water. And this idea kept germinating in his mind, and he kept ruminating about it. And lo and behold, after two years of a team of people gathering between scientists, between uh, marine uh, 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 en engineers between naval architects, sound engineers, lighting engineers, and environmentalists. We now have a Blue Isle lounge on each of these Explorer class ships. And what does it do? There are two glass panels on either side of this lounge. And each of these is about 75 square feet. There are 18 plates of glass. It's as strong, if not stronger than steel and it brings you a lot closer to the environment in which you're cruising. What it does beyond that is to make a modern day explorer out of anyone that visits this lounge. It highly sensitizes one to the place we're in. The Blue Eye Lounge also has hydrophones uh, in the lounge so you can hear the sounds of the ocean, whether it's the dolphins or whether it's shrimp that make a lot of noise or whether it's simply the ocean making its own uh, noises just so you feel intrinsically part of the environment and feel mm -hmm. like you're one. To the right of that is another very unique ship that will be launched in May of next year. That's uh, Le Commandant uh, Charcot. It's our uh, ship that will do polar expeditions. Uh, it will do quite uniquely uh, the North Pole in a very first for the industry. It will be a luxury vessel and it will be powered by a hybrid of liquefied natural gas and electric power. Uh, so in, in the summertime, it will do the North Pole, and, and in the American winter, she will be in Antarctica uh, doing uh, the Ross Sea and going to Bellinghausen for the emperor penguins and doing trips like that. Uh, so that is Ponos fleet. Uh, all of these are open for sale today, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, they are all classified as being clean ships. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, if I may. Um, we have a wide portfolio with the 12 vessels. We cover virtually every part of the planet, from the North Pole all the way down south into Antarctica, from the east in Japan all the way west into Alaska and every place in between. So there are over 400 itineraries. And I have to tell you, I mentioned a while back in 2010, we were unique in launching uh, sustainable practices and ex luxury expeditions for the first time in the world of cruising, combining the world of luxury with the world of expeditions. And of the 400 cruises, a third of them, 45% uh, of them actually are all expeditions. They range from the polar and the ice into the tropical world. They are certainly there in the Seychelles, the Scattered Islands and Vanilla Islands. And they're also in the tropics, <clears throat> in the Solomon Islands, in the South Pacific, as well as uh, in Indonesia and other parts of Asia. So a remarkable opportunity for people to experience a world where, in essence, the, sh the spotlight is always on the destination. Shall we move to the next one, please? 
This is, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of, of time here because um, I know that the, um, the sustainable practices, a lot of people talk about that word, but what really is a clean ship? You talk about clean ship, what does that mean? They're a little bit beyond green and it's a certification that Bureau of Veritas that is a classification society offers. Uh, the Ponant fleet has this certification and, there, and it requires you to have a lot of features. So I'll speak to some of the features, not all of them. Uh, so for example, uh, when there's wastewater on the ship, we don't discharge uh, that water without first uh, making it go through a filtration and in some cases even going through uh, an osmosis system before the water is discharged. So no wastewater, no black or gray water is discharged into the ocean. I'll speak to another one, which is um, uh, using dynamic positioning. Let's say you're in a very sensitive area and Grant referred to several parts within the Vanilla Islands that are highly, highly fragile environments. You don't have to drop anchor with the technology which is available on our ships and began with the Boreal class that we launched in 2010. You can use the ocean currents to hold your position in such sensitive areas, such as the Vanilla Islands that we are referring to. Yet another one that I think may interest uh, people is that we can uh, map the ocean floor and also use sonar to make sure we are aware of uh, uh, different objects uh, within the ocean as we navigate it. Uh, so there's a significant amount that goes into making these ships be a lot more sustainable. And then just one last uh, element I'll see to, and that's the silent electrical propulsion system. It does not use uh, any other fuel but electricity, which is a lot cleaner than using petroleum-based fuels uh, for its propulsion in the engine, uh, off the engine and the propeller. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a remarkably clean system to use on board the ships. Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, I, I just, um, I'm, I'm looking at what we, we wanted to also show um, a, a short video of your, um, your sustainable practices, which is really wonderful. And I wanna make sure that we fit it in. It's only two minutes long, but I wanted to make sure that we didn't um, you know, uh, cut any of the other things that you wanted to talk about you know, with Ponant. I know we had a couple of pictures here about um, your, the people who you have on board who are also into, involved in sustainability. And then we wanted to just show people at least a picture or two you know, of what the interior of your vessels looked like. Could we kind of move to that? Is that okay? Absolutely. And, and you know, Pono has a director of sustainability uh, who also leads our expeditions uh, uh, and the entire team of naturalists, Nicola de Brol. He has a home in Northern Greenland. He's been doing expeditions uh, since he was 17. He's been doing them well over 25 years. Uh, rooms like the gorgeous and stunning owner suite, uh, which you see from our Explorer class ships are uh, remarkable. And he tells us it is a true oasis after you've uh, enjoyed uh, the environment of the vanilla islands, which in some cases in the scattered islands can be so remote, you might be the only people there in the harsh sun uh, that you truly begin to respect and enjoy what these ships offer as respite following that. So if we can just move on to another slide, I'll share another aspect, which is that our ships are designed in a way to bring the light in from the outside into the public areas and into your stateroom. And in designing our Explorer ships on the top left, you see a stateroom. It is using a lot of fabrics that bring in the primitive nature of different parts of the world that are very fragile that we visit uh, on our expeditions. Uh, to the right, you see the lounge. Uh, in, in the bottom left, you see the lobby and reception area, and to the bottom right, you see the main restaurant on the Explorer ships. Moving right along. And 
the Explorer ships are all equipped with a marina that can operate in three different positions. Uh, it has an infinity pool. It can be used to launch our Zodiacs and it can be used as a sports platform. Here are some images of that. And in the back, uh, on the bottom right, you will see the image uh, of the uh, cantilevered or cascading uh, aft of the ship that offers ample deck space to truly enjoy the environment, irrespective of which destination you're in. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's perfect. Thank you, Naveen. And that brings us actually right to um, where we could start the video that we have, which again, it's two minutes, but it's very, very well done in, in really showing your green initiatives and also the awards that you won over the years for sustainability. So if we could go ahead and tee that up and put the uh, put the video up. And while we're doing that, I wanted to mention again that we will be having Q&A after this two minute video. So if you haven't put your question in yet to either Grant or Naveen or to me, go ahead and put that in ask a question and then we will be right back after the video is over. As lovers of the sea and wondrous treasures of our planet, Bonal is committed every day to the protection of the environment and respect for indigenous communities. Starting with the design of our ships, we implement innovative technologies to reduce our environmental impact. Compact size of our ships, their design and the materials used help minimize our impact on the ozone layer and delicate marine ecosystems. Ona invents the luxury polar exploration ship, the very first of its kind in the world. Its main innovation is the use of liquefied natural gas, the greenest energy on the market. Its equipment surpasses the current regulatory requirements of the International Maritime Organization and even anticipates their evolution. To make every cruise valuable, the Commandant Charcot will house a mobile laboratory for use by scientists. Ultimately, our entire fleet can serve as logistical support for scientific research. When conceiving our cruises, we carry out an inventory of the biodiversity of the places we plan to visit. New itineraries are only validated after environmental studies and meetings with local groups to ensure their agreement and involvement. Working on the premise we protect better what we know, we want to make our passengers ambassadors of the places they visit. Specialists and naturalist guides bring their expertise to the landings and extend the experience on board during informative presentations. We build our itineraries in collaboration with local communities. We buy locally when we can, without impacting the resources needed by the local communities. Conan is committed to the preservation of traditional cultures and practices. For example, we support the Upanavik Fab Lab organization, which trains members of the Inuit community to maintain traditional skills and crafts. Actively engaged, Pomar supports many organizations and companies working for the protection of the poles and the environment. Our strong sustainable development policy has earned us many prestigious awards. Our resolve goes even further. We want to show that only sensitive, reasonable and sustainable tourism is responsible tourism. Oh, welcome back. We're going to invite now Naveen and Grant to come back on the screen together. And as they come back, let's uh, tee up a question that we have. And the, the number one question here, which I guess would go to, uh, to you, Naveen, because it's about the um, LNG. And it is about the sustainability of LNG. I know we've been talking about this for many years, about being the most sustainable fuel that's available in the marketplace right now. But there has been some recent news that it is, in fact, just because you can't smell it and you can't see it in the air does not mean that it doesn't have a particulate pollution. 
So tell us about that or what you know about that and whether you think that truly is a fuel of the future or are there other types of fuels that are being investigated that are being researched right now for the future? I think that there's continuous research on, on making uh, cruise, cruise ships uh, all the more efficient and more sustainable, but LNG today is very widely used in cruise ships. I know there's a study that was sponsored and propagated by uh, Tor Hagen uh, about a year ago that spoke to how LNG is really a myth and, and uh, it's very polluting. Uh, we have seen that uh, equally there are plenty of studies preceding that and since that that retort that um, and, and uh, LNG remains a very efficient way to operate ships today. There are other options that have been in existence for quite a long time. They include uh, nuclear power chips. We have chosen not to go, go that route. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be still more development uh, for use by cruise ships. There's another aspect to this that is not strictly LNG that I'd like to just speak to, if I may. And that is, I don't know how many are aware that cruise ships in general are about 3% of the marine traffic. And this industry should be really proud of the innovation it brings into the world of cruising and shipping. And yet for 3% of the traffic on the oceans of the world, we are invariably the poster child of everything that goes wrong with the oceans. And we should, we should be really, truly proud of what we've done and continue to do with innovation. Actually, I totally agree with you on that. As a matter of fact, uh, Grant, I know that you're involved in shipping in general, cargo ships, cruise ships, all types of vessels. And I believe that you feel the same way that in all the different types uh, that cruising really does step ahead of the other types of ships. Can you talk to that? Yeah, um, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, cruise ships are more sustainable, the energy is cleaner, and we're generally ahead of the game. And regarding LNG, I don't think it's the end game, but I think it will take us towards the end game. You know, it's not the it's it, it's a stepping stone of cleaner energy, but it's not perfect. It needs we need to find other uh, new energies. And in fact, I I I moderated a session for Clear uh, recently on, on that. But overall, when you look at all the shipping sectors, you know, of, uh, tankers, chemical, dry boat, cargo, it, cruise is the leader in terms of uh, the type of energy use, its impact on the environment. But we should be because we are in tourism, you know, and we have people who are now more consciously aware uh, of the environment. And therefore, we have to lead. And so far, we are leading, but we also need to do more. You know, it, it's going to be a perpetual move towards zero emissions. You know, the, the IMO ambition and their targets are are very strong, it, but the 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 stance they took is change, or we will be changed. Mm -hmm. And change is something that is happening in the cruise industry. You know, companies like Panon are leading the way, and others are following. Uh, but energies like uh, LNG are are not the end game, but they are they are part of the stepping stones we need to take to, to zero emission. But and you know what else? I think we have to remember where we came from and the leaps that we've made from where we came from. I mean, I think both of you are of the era that I am, that we remember what it was like in the 70s and, and in right. the 80s. And I recently stumbled upon a, um, a video from the 1970s of a small luxury line back then. And they were talking glamorously on the video about the beautiful cruising. And meanwhile, it was spewing black smoke into the air. And they didn't even attempt in the marketing video to cover that up because it was just something we all saw. It was the way cruising was back then. So have we come a long way? Yes. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. <laughs> but I think that we're, we're doing something. I think also a, a, a big key thing, I mean, we have lower emissions overall in cruise than other other shipping sectors. But, you know, if you have one shipping port, it's X amount of 
uh, even if it's less emission, it's still X amount. But if you have two ships in port, that's double. <laughs> if you have three, that's more. If you have four, that's more. And, you know, so also the number of ships in port at any one time is a, an issue that needs to be looked at, you know. And, and the cruise industry seems to think it has a, a port congestion problem. But it, when you look at the world and how big the world is, as as Naveen rightly portrayed, Penant go to every corner of the planet. If we deployed ships, you know, more liberally around the world, and we spread the ships and spread the the itineraries, uh, of which, that, for example, Indonesia, Indonesia is bigger than the Mediterranean, and they only have four hundred calls, which is equal to half of one port in the Mediterranean. This this tells you the, the the scope of the whole situation. So we don't really have a port congestion problem. We have a deployment problem, and we need to deploy ships further afield into more destinations, which I think there is a big appetite for anyway. With 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 the main source markets, it's becoming more interesting to go to more places and at different times of year. Why do we always go to the same port at the same time at the same you know, and, and we congest it? Why can't we spread it out for the whole year? You know, even going to the Mediterranean in the winter. And the Vanilla Islands, for example, is a season that goes from November to to March, April. And there's a cyclone season inside that. And all the cruise lines go in this short period. But the summer period, there's no cyclones. The weather's beautiful, 24 degrees, 26 degrees, not a single ship. You know, Grant, I, I totally agree with you because there was a time in the Caribbean when we first started our business in the 80s that you wouldn't dream of going to the Caribbean in July or August. That was considered off season. And now it's peak season because of family cruising. So we've come full circle on what's right and what's wrong. So I, I totally agree with you on that one. We're going to have one more question before we wrap up uh, and really appreciate your time today. And, uh, the last question is, uh, do you believe that the post-COVID traveler is going to be craving more authentic experiences and taking a look at why they travel and, and being a little bit more introspective? That would yeah. be for either one of you or both of you. Sure. I think we should both address it. Uh, I think that, that is always going to be uh, an aspiration of uh, tomorrow's traveler. Uh, people, people have so well endowed in this day and age versus 50 years ago that they really don't need a heck of a lot in the way of food and entertainment. Uh, they, they are seeking a higher level of satisfaction from their travel experience. They, they want to discover their own purpose on the planet. And I think travel to remote destinations, as Grant alluded to, Indonesia being a fine example of it, is actually prime for people to be able to discover themselves, discover their connection, and seek their own purpose in the world uh, uh, as, as they go about traveling. People will travel for a greater meaning than sheer indulgence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Grant, did you want to comment on yes. that? Uh, I agree with Naveen, um, but I would add that, that I think pre-COVID people wanted this and the desire for this was coming greater. This is why more luxury ships, smaller sustainable ships and more expedition ships are being built than ever before. And the trend is changing. You know, people want to go further afield. People want to embrace culture. They want to see new destinations and they want to see the some of the most uh, extremity parts of the, of the planet and they, they want to have new experiences. And I feel that that trend was already gathering pace before uh, COVID-19. And I think COVID-19 will will give us even more momentum in that direction. Uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And I would like to say that I was in Madagascar pre, uh, just before the main peak of COVID-19, but it was already there. And there were more uh, temperature checks there were more. Um, there was more consciousness and awareness in February, in Madagascar than I had experienced in in America and Dubai and in Europe, you know. And I had traveled to all in recent times, so I was I was very very shocked, but in in a pleasant way, you know, because as I got off every ship in February, 
in Madagascar, you know, the, there was a temperature scan and there were checks, you mm -hmm. know, and they wanted to know where I had traveled before, you know, that there was a big con conscious focus on it. Um, you know, so don't think if you go to Africa, you're not, you know, that they're not caring about these things. They are. And the numbers of, of uh, deaths in Madagascar, I think, is two for, for COVID-19. You know, so. you know, that's a very good point. That's a very good point that sometimes the smaller nations can, um, they can really maneuver faster and they can they can respond to things faster. So that's a very good point. Um, listen, gentlemen, this has been really wonderful having you both, seeing you both. Uh, Grant, thank you so much for being here all the way from Dubai. And Naveen, thank you for being here all the way from New York. And uh, we, we continue to wish you both well as, as the, uh, the world comes back to whatever its version of normal is. And we will continue to keep uh, working in the, in the cruise industry and, and coming back the, the best way that we possibly can. So thank you for being with us today. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to close the program by telling you that our next program is going to be on July 10. We're taking a little bit of a hiatus over the uh, 4th of July holiday. We've been focusing on smaller ships and smaller out of the way areas for the beginning of our program. And we're going to take a little shift this next time. And we're going to be speaking to one of the giants, Royal Caribbean International. And we've invited Nick Rose, Director of Environmental Programs and Environmental Stewardship at Royal Caribbean, to come on our program and tell us what they are doing, how they are responding, and what they are doing in a world that we're, that we're heading into right now. And what is it going to be like? And what is it going to be like cruising with Royal Caribbean in the future, now and in the future? So we'll be very, very fortunate to have him on on July 10. And we look forward to having you back. If you've already signed up, then you will get an invitation to come back. And please do tell your friends. And we would like to have um, anyone join us that, uh, that can. We really appreciate your attention and audience. And thank you very much for being with us. I'd like to also thank our production team here, uh, which is our, our office environment. This is what we're doing in a post COVID world where we're doing things differently. And our team is, is busily working on this type of project. So we're very happy about that and very happy to, to keep everybody, um, you know, really going strong in this, um, in this new environment. See you soon. Thank you.